Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, which will focus on uh, calf nutrition for jerseys. My name is Laura Daniels, and I'm happy to help bring you this webinar series as your host. Um, I am also a Jersey dairy producer. My farm is located in southern Wisconsin. It's called Hartwood Farm. I also have had the joy of working in animal nutrition for the last oh, over 20 years. And so I was happy to help Jersey put together this webinar series. And today we have for you as an expert in Jersey calf nutrition, Gary Moore, who is joining us from Cargill. He is a calf specialist with Cargill and has lots of great information to share with you today. The, the broadcast, the video, will take about 28 minutes long. And then after that, we'll have a live question and answer session with Gary. So please stay tuned for that. It's usually just as good as the presentation, all the great questions that you all send in. And please remember to use the um, the the uh, question function, the chat function, which is located on the right hand side of your screen, if you are uh, if you look down there, uh, Gary will be able to see those questions as they come in, and then at the end, I'll be asking those questions. So please type that question in as you have it. Um, also, all of your lines will be muted. It throughout the presentation, so the way we will take those questions is through the chat function. So at this point, we'll go ahead and get that video started and look forward to the Q&A session a little later with Gary Moore. We're uh, here at Dutch Hollow Farm to do the nutritional part, cat nutrition calf part of the uh, Jersey uh, um, online videos. Uh, I'm Gary Moore. I'm a calf specialist with Cargill Animal Nutrition uh, and uh, long history with Dutch Hollow Farm where we're at now uh, with the Chittenden family. Uh, so pleased to be here. like to uh, thank a couple people, uh, Dutch Hollow, uh, for allowing us to do it here and uh, Sue Greth who's a teammate of mine that likes the IT stuff uh, so we put this together. Um, like to cover the things on jerseys with uh, what's different than the bit larger breeds, what's the same, and maybe where we need some more research on. The three areas that I'd like to cover is building the immune system and then growing the calf for its, for its peak potential, reaching the genetic potential, and also uh, where we fail a lot of times is uh, the transition part of, of going from a milk diet to a dry diet. So the first thing I'd like to cover is, is building the immune system. Um, for years we thought just getting two quarts of colostrum into a calf was enough, and it's not. Now there's some difference between volume-wise between a Jersey and a Holstein. Uh, I still like to see if we can get three quarts in that first time. Uh, I'd like to have the colostrum checked. With Holsteins, you're looking at maybe a 22 on a refractometer. Uh, and then a bricks refractometer, 17 or 18 on a jersey seems to be adequate. I think the big thing is any chance we get to improve that immune system, we probably should do it because it may mean, number one, a healthier calf uh, and a more productive animal when we get done. So I like to see at least three quarts that first time that they'll drink it. I also like to see another feeding or two after that where we would feed another bottle of colostrum uh, for the second and even the third feeding. I think what we're seeing for results and what research has shown us, there's some advantage to that. Um, where we're running short of colostrum certain times of the year or whatever, what we're finding is if we enhance that, that, that first milk, which is the milk we take after, uh, after feeding colostrum, if we enhance it with more IgGs, we're actually doing a pretty nice job. Um, so if there's not enough colostrum, don't throw away that next feeding. Feed it, because uh, we'll get some use out of it. If you enhance it with more IgGs, uh, we'll get there. I do like, when I'm doing that, I do like to use a product that's made specifically for enhancing colostrum uh, and not a colostrum replacement that we're just going to use a, a, a lower volume of. So uh, when we do that, we're finding that we're getting as good a quality, as good as, as, as 
is building that immune system. Uh, so your total proteins uh, are going to be as high as we are by feeding a colostrum replacement. Um, when we go forward with that, getting those other feedings in there is shown to be a huge advantage um, where we're, we're trying to build that immune system. We had a, a, a Jersey Holstein mixed herd in northern New York. Uh, we ran into some issues where the Jersey calves were getting sick, not the Holsteins. And what it was, they were just taking frozen colostrum out. So there's a higher chance of the Jerseys actually getting Holstein colostrum and not Jersey colostrum. We couldn't get them to separate it. So when we enhanced the colostrum right before we fed the Jersey calves, uh, the problem went away. We just were not getting the results on the Jersey calves that we wanted when we fed them Holstein colostrum. So uh, we're looking at a smaller body size, but we also know we need to get the quality colostrum in those Jersey calves if we want to keep them healthy uh, and move forward with that. Part two, feeding calves to their full genetic potential. Uh, the research that was done at Virginia Tech, and, and, and Bob may have alluded to it in, in, the, in the heifer program, Jersey calves on the average, when given the opportunity, will eat around that 90% of what Holsteins will eat. At home where we have both, we feed the Jerseys the same as we do the Holsteins. Uh, so the Jersey calves, we're getting six quarts of, of milk into them uh, on a daily basis by day two or three. Uh, and they, we move them up to eight quarts uh, and we only feed two X because nobody's there during the day. Uh, it's a small farm. Uh, so they're, they're eating at the same level the Holsteins do. The difference here is that Jerseys may take a little longer to transition when you're feeding those high levels of milk. And we'll go through some ideas on that a little bit later. But getting that intake up very early is huge. Um, I think that's when an opportunity comes for disease to set in, so let's feed above it if we can. And there's enough research out there that shows, hey, we need to do that. Just remember, the amount they eat at one time may not be quite as high as a Holstein, but given the opportunity for a 24-hour period, they'll come pretty darn close. We want Jersey calves to double their birth weight in 56 days, or maybe even come close to two and a half to triple times that. The healthier the calf is, the more it's going to grow, which is probably why I push so hard on the immune systems. Um, when we're trying to double that, which means probably 1.1 pounds when you do the calculation, average daily gain, I like to see more than that because these calves are aggressive. The one difference on Jersey calves, the same as Jersey cows, is, you know, they mature quicker, they're ready to roll. Well, the Jersey calves will too, but we gotta feed them in order to get to that point. Uh, so I like to feed them pretty heavy uh, and uh, try to see if we can't get that, that growth to come. News flash, <laughs> we uh, need clean water, starter fed starting at a very, very early age and uh, just the support they need to go along with it, which is nothing new, but as some of the times we, we see, we've gone very technical and not covered the bases that we want to early on. On that note, we starved Jersey calves for a long, long time. Uh, I can remember as a young one, well, you only feed it a quart of milk because they're smaller. Uh, that's not what the Jersey's about. We need to feed them more and, 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 and make it work. We had uh, one, one comment that always stuck with me is a uh, 100-pound Holstein calf uh, at day two of age, uh, if it's fed one pound of milk solids a day and it's zero out, which in this area and in a lot of areas in the country we see, they'll lose their entire reserve body fat within 18 hours. Realize a Jersey calf is born without even a lot of reserve body fat. So that stress period may be even more. The differences I see is, is when a Jersey calf starts going downhill, they'll go a lot quicker. You don't have a lot of time. So if anything I can do to prevent that calf from getting in that situation, I think it's better off for us. So preventative means let's feed more, feed the immune system. That We need to feed the calf enough to grow and also enough to uh, maintain itself and also uh, enough to uh, run the immune system. And the immune system generally is the first thing that's checked off when there's not enough uh, feed going into the calf or enough energy going into the calf. So it's very appropriate that when we feed more, uh, feed them more. Three times a day feeding will work if you can fit it into the schedule. Probably calves, Jersey calves will do a lot 
more with that. Part of that feeding Jersey calves is, is just get more into them. We had a herd that we worked with, another herd in northern New York where it was not uncommon to have uh, 20 below zero weather. Um, the herd man the calf manager called me and said we lost 13% uh, of the calves uh, in the first two weeks of January. And this is a farm that basically only lost 1% of calves year round. Half part of the calves were Jersey, part were Holsteins. We were feeding a one and three quarter pounds of milk solids a day. Uh, we figured out that when we, we needed to feed more, we moved that up to 2.2 pounds of milk solids a day and, and ended up with, within a week's time, going back down to that 1% or below calf loss. Nothing else had changed. The weather was still ugly. It's just that we were not maintaining the maintenance requirement of that. And Bob James at Virginia Tech had, had shown that when it gets down that low, we're probably in the 94 to 96% increase in, in maintenance just to keep that calf going. So don't be afraid to feed more. In extreme conditions, uh, they'll need more. Talk about feeding milk replacers. Uh, I love whole milk. Sometimes it's harder to manage than milk replacers. I'm a firm believer that there's a, there's a two type feeding system for, for baby calves and, and even maybe more critical Jersey calves. When we look at what the Jerseys will do as a breed, um, when we balance amino acids, they actually seem to respond quicker than the bigger breeds and, and for more milk. It's the same thing when we balance amino acids in baby calves, we get that response and it's pretty critical. So when we go ahead and we start uh, looking at what we want for a milk replacer feeding program, I'm a big believer uh, in feeding a two-part system if we can get it done. One is balance amino acids and we're fine with a 22 to 24 percent protein, uh, maybe 20 percent fat. I seem to be stuck on that one, not moving a whole lot. Um, and let's, uh, let's keep that calf on that. And I think you can go farm to farm basis. If a lot of issues, a lot of pressure, maybe keep the calves on that three to four weeks. I like to see them on two to three weeks anyways. Uh, and let's, let's, at that time, move that level up. You know, like I said, we've got, we got I like a 13% solution. Jerseys, I think you can go a little higher on solids, but, I prefer to feed more and keep the solid level the same. I think that extra fluid on those baby calves is huge. And uh, so if we're running around that 13, 13.5% 13 solid level, just feed them more. Um, what I do like to see is I like to add IgGs into that, into that uh, calf's diet. And uh, I'll go back to, okay, this never happened to anybody else but me. You have a cow calf out in the back lot uh, you don't know it because you're busy, and all of a sudden you say, oh, geez, there's a cow that must have calved out there. You go out and you have trouble catching the calf. I know nobody else has done that but me. And then you think, what did happen to that calf to make that so healthy uh, compared to the conditions when we're doing the very best protocols we can and making these calves very healthy? It comes down to first milk. Uh, the colostrum, I think we're doing better than what the cow is going to give on her own. It's generally cleaner, and we're doing a little better job on, on getting into the, more into the calf to begin with. But where, where we look at it is, once that calf's 24 hours old, and the absorption sites have started to shut down, uh, these functional proteins, and IgGs are functional proteins, have a specific job in the calves, and actually they coat the lining of that calf's gut. So when we're trying to replace that in milk, um, you can do it by adding IgGs in, in either to the milk or having it in the milk. And I think that's huge. So I like to do that. And also we found some additives uh, that seem to help, especially early on. So I would, I would spend my money up front on the first two to three weeks. And then after that, we've had some, some luck going with a lower fat. Now, I don't want to go too low because there's things like your fat soluble vitamins, your AD&E that needs to have that fat level move uh, move forward. So I don't like the hair coats when I lower the fat level too low and I'm wondering if there's something that we're doing. But I think you can get the fat drop, keep your protein level up, which bring in, which actually brings you a, a little bit more of the lactose in and get these calves, keep the solid level the same, feed the same amount of solids but then go ahead 
and allow that calf a little more uh, intake on starter. When we look at fat, it can be very satiating. And uh, when I was young growing up, my family didn't have a lot of money, so we actually got to eat ice milk instead of ice cream. Um, you can eat a lot of that and still eat dinner. Um, but it's the same thing, fat being satiated. If we use the technology and take the fat level down, uh, we can come up with uh, allowing that calf the same amount of solids, plus they're still hungry enough to start coming on starter. And I think our transition will go a lot smoother. Uh, I think we want the fat level a little higher, the energy a little higher in those first two to three weeks of calf's life, especially the Jersey calves. And then I think we can manipulate that diet to allow a smoother transition by just lowering the fat, keeping the solid level the same. Uh, not knocking any of the products that are out there. I've seen a lot of calves raised on a lot of different setups. Uh, but I think we can, if we're buying a, a powder to use, I think we can manipulate that to make get a better calf, starting them off good, and then having them transition, which would be the next biggest issue. And like I said, balancing amino acids, I think is very, very critical in Jersey calves. It allows us to keep that protein level down enough so that we're not putting extra urine uh, and fluids in the pen, which allows for a, a, an environment that's probably not as healthy for the calves. I would say there's research wise, we possibly could use some more uh, at determining where that proper protein level is uh, for Jersey calves versus a larger breed. I think there's a lot of even the ones we have out now, uh, essentially I'd like to see us getting those down because I think if we're balanced amino acids on those calf diets, I think we can get a little lower and uh, not hurt the calf growth at all, but help us with the environment the calf's in. When we talk about milk diets, and I love feeding calves whole milk, and we have people that feed it acidified milk, um, which is fine. I think when we look at trying to use the technology because it's different than when the calves were born and raised on the cow's milk and used a little bit of grass to get the digestible NDF up and start forming a rumen. We're trying to push these calves through quicker than what mother nature intended us to. Um, so I think when we take whole milk and we enhance it, and the enhancer we use is like a 23.8, what we're doing is we're allowing the protein level to be pretty much the same or a little bit lower, but we're dropping the fat level, and I think that's huge. When we get that fat level down so that we've got a ratio where a protein's a little higher, on, uh, a little higher uh, than, than the fat is, and then the Holsteins, we're looking at 1.3 to 1.4 parts protein the fat. That seems to work very well. The jerseys, I think we can be a little closer. Uh, may only be one to one to one, but we do see a huge advantage when we can drop the fat level down so it's a little bit lower than the protein. What happens is the structural growth on these calves look good, and I think they come on starter a lot better because we've manipulated the, the fat level in that, that product. Um, here again, have no problem with a two feed system. With whole milk, if they're all being fed the same, it may be a little bit harder, but if we can just keep the fat level down, keep the protein level up, here again, if we can add amino acids so we help balance amino acids to that, that's huge. I think that, that, works, that works pretty good. That I would love to see more research on. And I think some of those and some of those uh, uh, milk proteins, the fat ratio, hopefully I'll live long enough I can get some of that done because I like seeing what, what happens when we manipulate these things and I see healthier calves. Dropping the fat level down, like we said, will help us tremendously with, with the, uh, the transition time on getting these calves off on the, on the feeding, so feeding dry feed. One of the things with feeding milk diets is uh, I tell people don't ever be afraid of using electrolytes as therapy. Um, we have people in you know, group pens where we'll mix up half half level dose of, of electrolytes and pails and just leave it there. Baby calves actually will drink a good electrolyte, a good tasting electrolyte, um, quicker than uh, they'll drink water. Uh, and I think this helps keeps keeps the calf's immune system fired up because the calves are staying hydrated. Uh, especially in hot, humid weather, this seems to work pretty well. The one I like is uh, we have one that we, we've worked with that we actually add IgGs into it which helps maintain that, that gut lining on the calves. 
So in the first two or three weeks of the calf's life, I have no problem just allowing the calf to drink some electrolytes. Uh, when it's hot out, I may uh, mix them up at night and leave them there and let the calves drink it. When it's cold out, I'll probably go out at 11 o'clock at night and feed the calves another feeding of milk or milk replacer before, before I head to bed because uh, they need that, that more fluids. But realistically, whether it's cold or hot, keeping the, that calf's uh, fluids up so that they can maintain that, that hydration and maintain the immune system becomes very, very important. So don't be afraid to use electrolytes. Don't wait till the calf is sick or dragged out before we start putting them in. Use them as a therapy. It, it's not, it doesn't have antibiotics in them, and I think it's huge. I think we miss an opportunity when we don't use them. Now the third phase that uh, I'd like to go into is, is transition times, and we've seen time and time again where that, that becomes a bigger issue. I have one rule, and this is rule number one. The more milk you feed, the longer that transition period has to be. And that's the same whether you're doing Holsteins or jerseys. Just remember, jerseys, we're, we're, uh, we're smaller calves, so smaller capacity, we've got to make that work. Not that they can't be aggressive and get to that point. A lot of times, the jerseys at home, I may cut them down at the same time, so their, their diets drop down uh, with the amount of milk solids they get. But I may keep them on just a few days longer on that lower level as we're transitioning calves through. So just remember, more milk fed, longer the transition period. And here again, going back, if we can drop the fat level in the milk, I think that helps that transition period an awful lot. So getting calves on uh, starter when they're, when they're two or three days of age, it's pretty important, just a handful. Don't put a whole bunch of grain in the pail. And have, with Jersey calves, is a, it's funny when you go on Jersey farms versus Holstein farms, the pails are a lot lower, okay? And I think there's, we need to look at that. Um, because the calf doesn't want to reach its neck up out over and try to eat something. So if it's at the right level, just put a handful in, let them play with it, uh, and then change it every day. There's no sense in putting more grain in there than what the calves will eat and let them drool over it. So uh, fresh feed, daily and just put enough in that they're eating as they start to eat wet feed a little more but don't overdo it when you're trying to get it into them and i like to see we always used to always need two pounds of average two pounds of uh, grain in and then you can wean them i'm i'm a lot more critical i like to see a, a, at least a half a pound of grain into the calves three weeks before we take the milk totally away and I like to see the jerseys at one and a half to two and a half, and if more possible, pounds of grain a day before we actually take the milk completely away. Remember, if we drop the, if you're feeding a large amount of milk and you drop that in half, that calf's being maintained pretty well at that size. And the grain, you need to have it into them a couple weeks before they're actually gonna do something for the calves. Um, same way with dry forage, like hay. If we can, or, TMR. We need to have that in that calf a couple weeks before they can, so they can grow the bacteria so they can start breaking that down. And you do, in a lot of situations, you have to reduce the milk in order to get the grain intakes that you want. And then when we go to starter grains, uh, same thing. Balanced amino acids, we don't need the protein as high. And remember that these jerseys, they respond to that. Uh, when we balance amino acids on jersey herds, when we first started working on that years ago, we saw almost the same pounds of milk increase than we did with the black and white. So they, they, they step up to the plate, they're gonna do that. We've just gotta allow them to do it. So I like balanced amino acids, keep the protein level in that, those starter grower grains down so that we can have less moisture in the pen so we don't have to deal with that quite as much trying to keep the environment healthy for them. I also like to have that combined with the proper carbohydrate ratio um, so we're doing we're, so that we're actually getting the proper carbohydrates in there to tie in with those proteins broken down amino acids that's why the amino acid requirement is so that important but if you can get those tied in so that you're getting the best use and the best growth of those calves I've seen a lot of people show people that want to feed all kinds of protein and then they're not balanced the, the carbohydrate right yeah they're not growing the calf they're they're making a stick so let's get things down so that they're balancing the proper amino acids with the proper carbohydrates, and then we're gonna grow a good calf and we're gonna keep them healthy growing. I have a slide in there that shows 
Uh, it's a forage quality schematic and it's made by Jay Geezy and, and I've used this over and over and over again and I want to give Jay credit for that because what it points out is that the quality of forage you need for those baby calves first coming on to, to dry, dry forage when you're transitioning them wants to be the same quality that you're feeding your fresh cows. Okay, so I guess my question is I'm not a big believer and I question putting in cotton seed hulls uh, which have no nutritional value or straw for a fiber source. That, that body capacity is small enough as it is. Let's put good forage in there and we can keep these calves healthy and keep them growing just out of meat enough of it when we go through. So good quality forage when the first forage we're getting into but bring it on at a very low level to start up with. I had someone that I had, had a lot of faith in and he said there probably should be a pound of dry matter a day to start with as we start these babies on uh, transitioning and, and, and going through the transition diet. So a pound at a dime a day, the next week you can move it up a little more. In some places where we've had a lot of issues and they didn't have good quality hay, where we've done is we've actually used a fresh cow TMR. That's not my idea. I admit it. I stole it from from someone else. Uh, give them credit for it. Uh, but it works where we've had issues because that fresh cow diet, little difference in amino acids, but you're looking at maybe a 45% uh, grain diet. The amino acids aren't totally off. Um, uh, and, and if you top dress on top of that, you're getting about a 75% uh, grain to forage ratio. And, and not bad, it fits in pretty nice. And then as the calves get a week or two older, you start dropping the dot dress, and then the TMR comes up more. So if you're not in a situation where you can just get a TMR balance for the young ones, uh, fresh cow TMRs will work. Uh, still top dress the grain and slowly, slowly take that away. Now, in saying that, don't run that TMR for more than, than six or eight weeks. Uh, Jersey calves have a uh, a luxury habit that they'll go ahead and, and uh, use more than they, they need if they want to. So you will actually put some weight on that they don't need if you leave them on that kind of a diet too long. But it works. So if you're balancing a TMR for the first transition, make sure that it, that it balances out right, but keep these calves taut rest for at least a few weeks uh, so that they, they can change over gradually. That seems to be a mistake where I say we're gonna move the calves, change the feed, and then wonder why we've ended up with a lot more respiratory problems uh, or, or coxie issues because we didn't allow that calf's gut and, and rumen to transition that way. So uh, high quality feed first on and uh, make that transition last a little bit longer. I, was, I uh, have a lot of faith in, in Bob James so hopefully this leads into what his, his uh, topic was on. Uh, but I wanted to thank everybody for uh, allowing me to do this. The final notes that I look at, and you see these pictures, the calf that's on the left was probably my, is my pride and joy. Uh, the, probably the best animal I bred. She uh, drank four bottles of colostrum. Uh, she is now here at Dutch Hollow because we have a space limitation at home. Uh, and she's probably gonna make projected ME probably 26 to 28,000. Uh, she out milked the Holsteins, uh, two-year-olds at home, um, and uh, done it on a much smaller frame. So I still believe that getting, getting the calf started off right, her immune system started off, the calf was never sick in, this, in her life. So I think that speaks to what we end up with. So the cow on the right is the baby calf, just a couple years later. Uh, and seems to be doing very well. I think when we look at the genetics and the genomics, everything we're using, um, I'll point out that this calf's dam uh, is minus two on genomics. But she uh, is, if not the highest, one of the top three or four animals on our farm in profitability. Meaning what, without taking the size any difference, is what she actually brings into the farm in income. Um, it can be done, but I think there's as much we can do on those babies, setting that immune system up right, growing them really well early on, uh, and getting these heifers in, in the right time in the, in the milking string um, started very early here and maybe make a bigger difference than what the genetics or genomics do.
So I'd like to thank uh, uh, Jersey for allowing me to spend a little time with fellow Jersey breeders and hope it helps. And I'm available to answer any questions anytime has, anybody has anything. Glad to know it. Want to see these Jersey calves grow up to be good cows. Thank you. We will, uh, we will go ahead and move into the questions uh, with Gary then. And, um, oh, got a lot of feedback this time. <laughs> so um, first question, Gary, for you that came in uh, was you mentioned feed or a milk replacer additives or some kind of additives for calves that are, um, less in in their first two to three weeks of age and I wonder if you might uh, tell us a little bit more about what kinds of additives seem to work well early on um, okay some of the additives that we use uh, uh, first of all I, I like putting IgGs in there um, can you hear me all right yes okay all right I like putting IgGs in there. Uh, there's been a lot of research on smart care. Um, and we have, I like putting at least that in there. And I'll, also at times I'll throw another Moss product in there also. Uh, anything I can do in the first two to three weeks of life, what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is get that product closer to what that first milk would be, the milk after colostrum. And um, it should be, and then to help those calves in the first two to three weeks of life. Great. Is there is there anything else um, that you uh, you know? I guess the the some of the farms that I've seen they're they're using some uh, moss products or some some other additives like that beyond the first two to three weeks. Or do you think focusing early is is the way to go? I think there's there's there is some value for the entire life that they're on milk. However, I think uh, firmly believe in what we're seeing. Probably the most use of it is in the first two to three weeks of life. That's when we're going to have the best results. That's when most of those issues hit calves the hardest. Although we are seeing some uh, viruses that are hitting uh, uh, later on, so there is some use all the way through. I don't want to don't want to disclose that. I guess I'm. I'm more willing to spend the money in the first two to three, maybe four weeks, depending on what what's going on with uh, with the calves. Yep, great, really good. Okay, next question, and this is uh, this is rather to the point: um, Is group feeding a fad? Uh, my answer to that is no. Um, because I'm seeing an awful lot of it still, in, in, at least in our area up here, we're seeing quite a lot. In other parts of the country, I know it's it's not as well represented. I think um, I think we're still going to see some of it, uh, and you're going to see some labor savings. But I think a lot of it is uh, these calves transition. And once, if you can do a good job in group feedings, and we have some customers that do, and, and friends of mine that do a really really good job group feeding. Uh, those calves transition pretty darn nice when they when they when they leave those pens. Um, I it's not something to be taken lightly. I think respiratory rates can be higher. Uh, I would like to see more work on that. To be honest with you, Laura. Yeah. I don't yeah, think absolutely. it's fad though. I think we're I think we're going to start doing it. Do you? Next question is a follow up to that one. Uh, there was another question on just housing in general. Do you think that there's a, a difference between the best housing for a Jersey calf versus a Holstein calf? Meaning, you know, do they perform better in individual housing or do they perform better than their Holstein counterparts in group housing? Um. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, oddly enough, I've seen jerseys actually sometimes take to the group housing better than the Holstein calves. Well, they're, a lot of times they're more aggressive at a young age. 
I, I think the the stuff that that Bob James did um, shows that you know the intake wise on those they can be very very well. Is there a difference in the housing? I, I that's a hard thing to say, other than the fact that you know you still got to allow enough space. You know, if we talk about group in Jersey's group in Holstein's and they say, well, you need 40 square feet, I'm telling you, give the 40 square feet to the Jersey's too. I think it's beneficial, but I think more into that is, are we getting the air through those groups that we need to be? Um, and at the level that the Cavs can use it, I think that's the biggest issue. But to answer your question, is there is there a difference? Uh, we've seen some pretty aggressive Jersey's uh, do very well in group, in group uh, group housing systems. Yeah, I don't think there's a great. huge difference there. Yep. Well, good. Okay, next question is, um, you talked a lot about the value of colostrum and just how important it is to get enough in early. Um, there's a lot more discussion about fresh colostrum. It always reminds me of these cheeseburger joints that are like fresh, never frozen beef. <laughs> and what is the value of fresh, never frozen colostrum for a, for a calf? I think the value more goes into what more research is being done on this. Uh, I think a lot of the value goes into what comes after that calf. Okay, um, it, it might not be so much as the, the immune system is what that yeah, calf's ability is down the road to breed, uh, to make milk, you know, to reproduce, uh, uh, all that stuff I think is, is probably closer tied to the fresh colostrum, meaning fresh colostrum from its own mother, okay? Um, the difference between fresh colostrum and frozen colostrum, if it's handled right, frozen frozen's still fine as long as you're not killing the IgGs when you thaw it out and you're doing a good job cooled down when you put it. Yeah. Yep, really, really good. Okay, next question is about uh, the other end of that uh, milk phase. How soon should any hay or forage be introduced to, to a cab diet? <laughs> Uh, I have a couple of uh, show people that I'm in business with, so they're going to tell you as soon as they'll eat it. Um, I, I'm, uh, I don't like to see hay or forage going into that calf's diet until they're eating a good amount of, of starter grain. Uh, and, and my, my point is at four to five pounds. Now, the only time I'll back away from that and say, put a handful in is if there are some digestive upsets or seeing some bloating or something like that where we can't find an absolute reason for but most of the time that's because water is not available when they need it or it's not good water but i like to see i like to see four or five pounds at least going into them uh and preferably up to, to six or eight pounds of the starter grower or a starter going into these calves um and before they get forage i just just know they can't use it uh, until they grow the bacteria in there. So I would hold that off as long as possible. However, like I said, if there are some issues going on, there is sometimes some advantage and it's basically slowing the calves down as they're eating the, eating the grain, basically what you're doing. When I first started doing this years and years ago, there was a lady that put rubber ducks in her grain pails just for that reason. Yeah, yeah, really good. Well, okay, next question is about starter as well. Um, you, you know, you, you talked about uh, the importance of the transition. So, so what, what are, um, what kind of things should we be looking for in a starter? Whole corn, cracked corn, does it matter? Pelleted, texturized, you know, I, I guess give us, give us a quick synopsis of what would be an ideal starter in, in your mind. Beyond just the crude protein level. Okay. Okay. Before before I get shot from a lot of other people, <laughs> um, <laughs> I uh, 
I, I'm, I'm a big believer in pelleted starter, and I was someone that didn't care for that years and years ago. And finally, I put groups of calves together and say, you tell me. And the calves, as an overall number of them, chose the pelleted starter, okay? Now, there is some value that I think on a, on a texturized feed that's got a decent amount of molasses. Those calves may actually take to it a few days earlier, maybe. Uh, but what we see in intakes back, and we've done a lot of this stuff back and forth, is the intakes, if the, if the formula is done correctly, okay? Uh, years ago, there was some research out there where they took a, a textured starter, ground it up, and pounded it into a pellet. And that was the worst thing they could have done. I prefer pelleted feed. Uh, in my area where we're at right now, we're lucky enough to have mini pellets, and I love those, okay? Um, we see great intakes with them, calves go well, uh, but that, but the overall formula needs to be put together right for what the calf requirements are. So I generally, without a doubt, I'd have to say right now that I'm a believer in pelleted calf starters. So if, if yeah. I'm trying not to offend any, because there's a lot of calves grown out there with, with textured feeds, with some of the, I've seen some meal feeds, and man, it's hard to poke holes in it, but. Uh, I've had the best luck of, of, of any form, uh, definitely being with a pelleted, pelleted starter. Okay, good. And I think this is the last question, unless we get another one that comes in here. Um, what, what are the major pitfalls that you see uh, happening most often as calves are weaned and transitioned uh, to that first pen after they would have been receiving milk. Okay. The biggest pitfall is we're not getting enough starter into them soon enough. Okay. Um, and then we're going to move them. And, and I don't know how many times you see this, but we move them and change the feed at the same time. So yeah. those are the biggest pitfalls. However, if we, we can get more starter into these calves and, and and what we see happening in a lot of places is oh my gosh we had too many calves now we got to wean some and move them out so the calves get weaned uh sometimes without getting the milk drop down or the solid level drop down and then we move them and then they wonder why those calves stand still for three or four weeks before they actually start to grow again if we can get the the fat level in the milk down or the solid level in the milk down. And I will do some more playing on this. Uh, I've got some stuff set up that hopefully next spring uh, and summer, I'll get some more information on this. But I, I think that we need to get the solid level of the milk down soon enough or the fat level down so that we got starter intake. Uh, and, then, and then we need to have the milk gone for a week minimum before we actually move them, when we move them, keep them on the same feed. The pitfalls are, okay, I'm gonna, and keep those groups as small as you can when you first put them in a group. That's one of the advantage of the of the uh, uh, mob feeding systems or the uh, auto feeding type systems. Those calves are already in a group of 15 to 25. Yeah. So they do well when they're positioned out to another pen. They don't, they don't have that, that issue. The other thing I see is you, is, is you need to have water available and you need to have um, the feed where they can get it. Um, you know, they'll have a, the, the, they've got to stick there, they'll make them stick their head through a, a, a headlocks or something like that. And then they got to put their head on the floor to eat it just by keeping that feed up. So, and if you can't put it on the inside for two or three days and then put it on the outside, but keep it up so they're not having to stick their head through and down. If they're just sticking their head through, you'll get a lot better intakes. And if the intakes are off too much in just a couple of days, that's when you end up with, you know, coxie issues. Um, uh, a lot of times you'll see some respiratory issues because we haven't had the intakes in there to keep that calf's immune system going. But definitely, though, yeah, moving too quick and not better intake before they go. Yeah, it's, uh, I've been in a lot of brand new group feeding type barns where they have either small headlocks or small slant bars for the calves to eat starter, yeah. and then they don't even use them. They have a bunk that's at the calves level inside the pen because it's such a huge advantage in intake yeah. early on. 
It, it is. It's huge. Put the feed and put the water where the calves can find them and they don't have to work to get there. Yeah, exactly. Well, great. Well, thank you to everyone for sending in questions. Uh, special thanks to, to Gary for hosting this uh, with us today. Uh, really great, very down-to-earth, uh, applicable type information, Gary. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Laura. Thanks for what you're doing with this, too. Appreciate the part of being able yeah. to be with some Jersey people. Yeah, Jersey people are the best people, aren't they, Gary? <laughs> um, <laughs> I know you probably can't answer that. So anyway, uh, to all the Jersey people out there, we want to thank you for, for joining us on this series of webinars. Uh, for those of you who have joined the, each of the, of the implements in the, in the series, um, we want to thank you for joining us every other week for the last uh, several weeks here. For those of you who haven't seen all of the webinars, don't worry. You still can go and catch up on all of the previous webinars. And just to let you know what they what they covered, we had a, a, a webinar on transition cows and then the milking herd on heifers, and now today uh, covering Jersey calves. And you can view all of those previous webinars at US Jersey at the U at the US Jersey YouTube channel. That is the best place to, to capture those. Also, the PowerPoint presentations that were used for each of these sessions are also available at the AG, AJCA uh, website. National All Jersey would love to hear feedback from you on how these webinars help or your ideas on how we can make them better for the future. Also, any comments that you have at all about this web series or anything that has to do with Jersey cows or Jersey nutrition, please pass that along to naj at usjersey.com. Thanks again to everyone for watching, and also thank you for everything that you do to get the most out of the Jersey cows. We appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.